So, part two of our discussion on thermoregulation. Models of thermoregulatory uh, control. To this point, we have tried to understand how heat balance is affected, not why. This is why do we ever try to modify heat balance? What things in the body sense changes in heat flow, changes in conduction and convection, and how do we regulate our normal internal temperature? And the spoiler is we don't know. We don't have a smoking gun to say this cell or group of cells in the body is a thermostat and when it gets too hot, it starts to cool. We don't know for sure. It's really hard. It's very invasive. And for where these uh, centers of thermoregulatory control are, you can see why we perhaps don't know. We have limited <clears throat> these regions to within the hypothalamus. So there's red flag number one. Really hard to study the hypothalamus, especially in living people, which is where there would be thermoregulatory control. You can't take a cadaver and figure out when it starts to sweat. The hypothalamus specifically is our thermal center. We know that it receives input from different organs, from the skin, on temperature or information related to heat. And we know there are um, efferent pathways that turn on countermeasures. Hypothalamus is central to both of those. We've even broken it down so far as to say the anterior portion uh, deals with heat loss and the posterior portion deals with heat gain. So if we're too hot, the anterior half is more active. If we're too cold, the posterior half is more active. More than that, it's difficult to say what signal are they responding to and in what situations. We do know that there are even, there's crosstalk between these two regions, which is good, right? If we're too cold and we want the posterior hypothalamus to start turning on our mechanisms of heat gain, whatever those are, we don't also want heat loss to occur at the same time. We want the anterior portion to be turned off. Just like if you're trying to do a bicep curl, you don't want your triceps to also activate. Your biceps and triceps activate at the same time, your arm doesn't move. So we need that reciprocal regulation or reciprocal inhibition. So we have three controversial models. <coughs> Excuse me. And like I said, there's no smoking gun. The first one is what I think a lot of people gravitate to because it's our easiest way to understand thermoregulation. This is the adjustable set point theory. It's the first one proposed and this uh, describes that thermoregulatory mechanisms are turned on when temperature is different from what it's supposed to be. We have an ideal temperature and if what we're sensing is different we thermoregulate accordingly. But already we're presented with some problems. What temperature? Are we regulating the hypothalamus? Are we regulating the nebulous core? Is it skin? Is it the brain? Where is that set point? And if you think about it, if we're different, if we're measuring a different temperature than what the set point dictates, this model implies there is an on or off switch. If it's different, turn these systems on. But just in practice, you know from experience, our responses are typically graded. You don't sweat profusely right away, it ramps up. So a couple problems with this theory. A few more are that there's no one static set point. Set point changes. So we like 37 degrees. That's ideal. But ever had the flu or fever? I had one last year over reading week of all times. It was great for not interrupting lecture. 
but the experience as a whole was really terrible. So you get a, you get a fever, your normal 37 degrees, where you would normally regulate, is now 39, 39 and a half. And if you're 38 degrees, you're shivering. So I had uh, sweatpants on, a hoodie, blankets, everything, and I'm still in the covers on the couch shivering. The, the set points changed. How is that possible if we have one thermostat? The counterpoint to this argument is you take something like aspirin and you can artificially lower the set point, even without a fever. So there's less evidence that there's one set point, one ideal, because we have external control over it. And not only is there external control, but there's natural variation. As you move through the day, the set point changes, even if you're healthy. Your temperature is typically lower in the morning and higher in the afternoon. And that happens every day. And it goes back down overnight and then higher in the afternoon. How is it possible if there's one thermostat that the set point changes? Uh, not randomly, but regularly. In some other specific cases, women deal with this. The um, set point changes during the menstrual cycle. Temperature is affected by hormonal release, so in the second half of the cycle, it's one degree higher. That really flies in the face of there being one thermostat that says 37 is ideal because we have this variation, many different circumstances where uh, temperature is regulated differently than if it were controlled by one thermostat. Higher set point during the second half of the menstrual cycle. This was um, the focus of a study that one of my students did two years ago. She was really interested in this concept and then specifically how caffeine um, worked in either phase. Caffeine is a, a nice ergogenic aid, usually helps performance. Uh, temperature tends to be one of those signals that slows you down, that limits performance. So she wanted to see, does caffeine work as well here in the early follicular phase as it does here in the luteal phase. And oddly enough, it didn't. It worked better in this phase. But you can see the difference in regulation, 36 to 37 degrees, lower throughout the first half of the cycle, higher throughout the second half of the cycle, doesn't really jive with what we know about a set point theory. And it doesn't agree with the uh, schematics that I put in your slides that I'll show here of a basic negative feedback loop. So this theory proposes what's shown on the slide. It says, okay, we have a, a thermostat that we're reading and blood and internal temperature, wherever that is, if it's higher, well, the brain says, okay, start to sweat and move hot blood to the periphery so we can get rid of that heat. Hopefully, we'll bring that temperature back down. And if we sense that it's back down, we'll turn off those mechanisms. That's a classic negative feedback loop. And that's what would happen in this scenario. The opposite is true if you're thinking of, uh, of cold stress. If we're too cold, turn on heat generation mechanisms, and then hopefully the blood warms back up. We sense it and turn them off. Different sides of the same coin. And this is a really easy way to understand thermoregulation. You have experience with this uh, from talking about blood pressure. This is how we regulate blood pressure. But there's no one clear set point, so there must be more to this um, flow chart. And that extra layer was described recently as reciprocal inhibition. And this model allows graded responses, whereas in the first model it's on or off, Reciprocal inhibition, uh, inhibition allows graded responses. And it might allow the set point to change. So what I mean by reciprocal inhibition is, imagine in the first theory, you got the two halves of the hypothalamus. They're just sitting there quietly. If you're cold or hot, one turns on. 
The second theory suggests that instead of sitting quietly, the two halves are always trying to override the other one. They're always active. And if there's a, a heat stress or if there's cold stress, it prevents one half of the hypothalamus from working as much. So it removes some of the inhibition. And if you remove some of the inhibition, it allows the second half to work a bit better. So a, a graphical representation would be over here on the right. We live in this null zone. If everything is going well and we're at 37 degrees, the inhibition is equal and opposing. There's no cooling going on. There's no heating going on. We're just content. But let's say there's a heat stress that occurs. We're moving towards the right of this graph. What would happen is the, the cold inhibition would be gradually removed. And so the activity of all of those um, heat dissipating mechanisms would gradually go up. And that would act to put us back down into this null zone. You're sitting in the middle of a valley and if there's ever variance on either side, gradual removal of that inhibition would, would push us back towards the middle. And so this really nicely allows for the graded responses we see. Sweating is a perfect example. Start to sweat gradually and it ramps up over time. It might also allow for this null zone to move. So in response to a fever, there's no numbers here, but maybe this is uh, slid a little bit to the right or to the left, depending on what the external factor is. What I think is a really nice explanation is a third example. I'm not going to go too much into depth about reciprocal inhibition. It might work uh, quite well. The, the big catching point here is if that null zone can slide. It might, but we, we're not sure how we would measure that. So heat flow is an idea that we're not concerned with temperature. We're not so concerned with 37 degrees. And instead, what we're concerned about is how quickly we're warming up or how quickly we're cooling down. And that goes to the example I gave you of going outside to walk my dog at night. I'm cooling down quickly. I'm not cold yet, but I'm aware that I'm losing heat quickly. And so heat flow describes that scenario where Regulating body temperature is a secondary symptom of regulating heat flow or heat balance. And what's really nice about this, um, about this model is that it allows for feed forward and feed back control. And I'll show you what I mean. So this is a trace of someone exercising and how their core temperature might change. So core temperature is at the top, and then this is exercise at the bottom. So you're sitting at rest, and you decide to go for a run. You start exercising right away. It's abrupt. And you exercise for however long, and then you stop. That's exercise. Now we don't start to dissipate heat right away. It's not an on-off switch. It's graded. So at the start of the run, we might notice a creeping up of core temperature. We might see a gradual turning on of heat dissipation mechanisms. And one that I like to include is the idea of sweating. You'd probably start to sweat somewhere on this slope. How does that happen? You're not hot yet, but you're starting to sweat in advance of being too hot. And this can turn up, you can get, you can start to lose more sweat. It's dependent on the rate of heat production. We have this large rate of heat production and it acts as a feed forward signal to turn on sweating before we get too hot. 
it's a really nice catch to prevent us from getting into a situation where there's no return, where we're too hot and we're going to fatigue. Also consider that we allow core temperature to go up. You start to exercise, and it doesn't increase and then come back down, like might happen with the thermostat model, or what should happen with the thermostat model. We allow it to go up, and it stays stable as long as you're exercising. Then, if you've ever noticed after a nice long hard bike ride or a run in the heat, you stop exercising, sit down on your couch or sit down uh, outside on a picnic table, you're sweating, and then that turns off pretty quickly. You're still hot, the signal is still there, yet the mechanism has turned off. How is that possible? The thermostat model wouldn't allow that, but if it's a measure of heat flow, all of a sudden, heat flow is a lot less positive. The rate at which we are heating up is a lot lower, and so we don't need to thermoregulate. We know that over time, we'll cool off just passively. So a few examples that really contribute to the idea that the change in heat load is what we're regulating. But then, if that's the case, how would we ever measure that? How would the body ever sense that? How would the hypothalamus do calculus, right? Calculus is the rate of change of something. How would the hypothalamus do calculus? Maybe there's an answer. I don't understand it, but maybe there's an answer. So a few different models of how we might thermoregulate. There's pros and cons to each. This seems like um, one of the most likely models, at least in my opinion. But it's also possible that it's a mix of all three. Maybe there's reciprocal inhibition around a certain set point, and then how much inhibition we have depends on the rate that we are heating up. Let's finish off strong. We've got 10 more minutes, and I briefly want to um, describe or allude to not models of thermoregulation, but now how we might quantify how stressed a person is in the heat or in the cold. So we've explored the, the elements that add to heat balance, that push us to become hotter, that allow us to become cooler. We've explored the reasons why the body might ramp up cooling or ramp up heating. And now I want to try to get a sense of how we would measure if someone's too hot or too cold. So that's what we're looking at in this little subsection, thermal stress scales. And we've already alluded to the idea of trying to combine all elements in the heat balance equation into one measure. We've already alluded to the Humidex. And this is showing you how you might measure Humidex. This is a really fancy thermometer. It does what's called um, wet bulb globe temperature, which describes the many different types of thermometers in this device. There are four different pathways of heat exchange that merge into one value to give a singular number the feels-like number of perceived heat. And if you were so inclined, you could calculate it according to this uh, value. But I'm not going to ask you to do that. I'm just going to describe what each of these sensors does. You know really well this one in the middle. Dry temperature. You put a thermometer in your mouth, you put a thermometer outside on your deck, and you're looking at how hot or cold it is. This is what you're measuring. You're measuring temperature. The other two elements 
add evaporation and radiation. So this, this dry temperature combines both conduction and convection. It's what um, is reported normally outside of the relative humidity. The wetted fabric, the, the wet temperature value over on the right-hand side, has a little uh, pocket that you put water into, and then this is a wick. So this is a fabric wick that wraps around a thermometer and sticks up and measures the temperature of evaporation. So water is always evaporating out of this fabric, and the thermometer inside is measuring how hot or cold that is. So this measures specifically the temperature of evaporation. Radiation is handled by this black globe. Wet bulb, globe temperature. And all the black globe does is protects the sensor inside from wind, protects it from the air, there's no conduction or convection, and protects it from vapor, so there's no evaporation. And it's colored black because black is the color that absorbs all radiation. So like humans, this globe aims to absorb all radiation that's placed upon it. And it's a sphere because radiation comes at it from all directions. So the reading inside here is the heat due to radiation specifically. You combine all of these factors together, you get the perceived heat due to conduction into the air, convection of air currents, evaporation due to relative humidity, and then the radiation for the cloud cover at that given point in time. All of those four things combined into one number, giving us the, the perceived heat, the humidex, or the heat index if you're in the U.S. It's the exact same thing. Problem with this is that it takes a long time. This is like a 20-minute measurement. So even in scientific studies, we've done this before. I did a lot of studies um, on uh, hydration and ice hockey players in my uh, doctoral degree. And we were working with Gatorade for, uh, for one experiment with the New York Rangers at one of their practice rinks. And we wanted to do really rigorous scientific measurements. So we had this wet bulb globe temperature thing that we took out into the middle of the ice and we set it up for 20 minutes before they got on to practice and we got the feels like number. And that ends up being one line in a paper when you could also just say it's 8 degrees and 40% relative humidity. Really complicated, has to be stable, has to be um, undisturbed, takes a lot of time, and we often forgot it. So these guys are getting out onto the ice, you have to run out in your boots, take the thing off before they, uh, they knock it over. Complicated measurement, you got to do extra calculations, takes a long time, and that's pretty much why not everyone uses it. Even in the lab over here, I've just got humidity, pressure, temperature, that's it. So the other side to uh, the Humidex in cold temperatures is the wind chill. And this is what we would call perceived cold. This is also a feels-like number. It's analogous to the wet bulb globe temperature. And it's what you would uh, describe on days like today if you were working for the Weather Channel. It's minus 7 degrees, feels like minus 15. How do we make this measure? For the longest time, this was due, or, or wind chill numbers were based on how long it took water to freeze in plastic vials that were hung on a rack 10 meters above the ground in Antarctica. And so based on the wind passing by those vials, they'd take measurements of how quickly the wind would freeze and say, well, if the wind weren't there, it would have uh, been equivalent to this colder temperature. The wind made this water freeze faster. Here's the temperature that would have made that happen if there were no wind. And we use this for the longest time, regardless of the fact that... Um, Human skin might freeze faster or slower than water. We're not in Antarctica, and our bodies aren't 10 meters off the ground. So 
only recently, and I guess now it's not so recent, 17 years ago, a, co a comprehensive study was undertaken to figure out, okay, well, let's make this more physiological. We'll use humans in a cold environment and we'll measure, um, make measurements of cheek tissue. So how cool is the face being that that's probably most likely to be exposed and it's a pretty important area of the body. You don't want your head to freeze, if at all possible. The other thing that we've added is this is very conservative. So you've got recommended daily allowances for vitamins that cover the needs of, what is it, 50% of the population or something? This is, what is the threshold for the 5% of the population that's most susceptible? The majority of us, our cheeks might not freeze, but there are some individuals that are very sensitive and we want to generate this windshield data based on them alone because we don't want anyone getting injured. We don't want half of the population getting injured. We, we want none if we can help it. And so this is a very similar measurement. How quickly um, does the cheek cool to a point where the, uh, the skin temperature is in danger of causing tissue damage? And then what temperature would result in that same cooling without wind? And we end up with a graph like this, and there's no variance in this, uh, in this chart. You look and see, okay, what temperature is it outside today? And what's the average wind speed? If it's minus 10 degrees and winds gusting at 30 kilometers an hour, it's really minus 20. Uh, not kilometers per hour, I think this is meters per second. But you get the idea. Oh, no, it is. It is kilometers per hour. Principle holds up. It's actually minus 20, and then we have these shaded areas to indicate graded increasing severity. There's a high risk for most people in 5 to 10 minutes of getting frostbite in this really dark gray area. Don't want to spend a lot of time outside unprotected in that specific area. So these are our two main ways of quantifying the environmental effect, the perceived heat or the perceived cold. But these don't tell us how impacted the person is. How impacted the person is. To do that, we use... Um, heat strain and cold strain scales, individualized strain scales. Which again is highly conservative. We don't want anyone to get heat exhaustion. And it's individualized in that we take measures of the person and any of the other modifiable factors are included in that, in that measurement. If they are more or less fit, it's still their temperature. If they are taking drugs, we're still reading their temperature. If they're hydrated, acclimatized, we're still reading their individual values to get their strain. And the best characterized is this uh, physiological strain index, or the PSI, which specifically deals with heat. Not cold, specifically heat. We used to think heat was the be-all, end-all, and cold wasn't a problem. You just bundled up. So cold strain indicator was added next. We didn't feel like we had to differentiate the two. But physiological strain index deals only with heat. I'll show you the, uh, the scale, and then we'll call it for the day. We'll pick it up back here on, uh, on Tuesday next week. This complicated equation simply says... How much has your temperature gone up? And how different is it from 39.5? So we know that the upper limit of core temperature is around 40. We don't really want you to be above 40. So this says, from whatever your resting temperature is, how much has yours gone up? And does that compare, or how does that compare to 39.5? So this is a fraction to say, if my temperature has gone up, more than 39.5, I'm going to award myself five points. Now, strain is also influenced or um, 
signified by uh, the heart rate response. That can take into account drug, hydration, acclimatization effects. So this says, how much has your heart rate increased compared to 180? And we're using 180 as a threshold, as the upper limit. Heart rate can go higher, but we're saying if it's over 180, you might be in danger or start looking for warning signs. If it's increased from baseline to 180, I'm awarding myself another five points. So the PSI is scored at a 10. The closer you are to 10, the greater the heat stress, the individualized perceived heat stress. So I'll show you some examples of what kinds of environments lead to numbers on a, on a range, a variety of numbers on this scale, so you can get a sense of how the PSI changes. I'll show you the cold strain index, and we'll talk about some pretty, pretty terrible science as well. But I'll leave that as a, uh, a vague, ominous black box until we get back on Tuesday. Any questions before we end for the day? No? Okay. Fantastic. Have a wonderful Thursday. Enjoy your weekend and uh, see you next week.